17. Time. 1. The Moral Question. From the days of Parmenides, who held that change and becoming are irrational illusions, time has been a problem to metaphysics and also, in recent centuries, to scientific thought. This is not surprising. From the moment time became a metaphysical question, even the elementary problem of definition created major handicaps. Definition is a process of limitation, and there can be no definition without limitation. On the other hand, in an interrelated universe, and especially a universe with a transcendental framework of reference, Definition often eludes limitation. We know we are alive, but to define life is rather difficult. We live in time, but the definition of time creates serious problems and raises more questions than it answers. Moreover, another more basic question confronts us. Is the issue with respect to time a metaphysical or an ethical question? For the Orthodox Christian who believes that God is the creator of all things, time is an ethical, not a metaphysical, problem. It can also be argued that the metaphysical question is usually an evasion of the moral issue. Where God is denied, it follows that time and history become serious moral problems for man, who is then unable to provide a meaning for his existence and can affirm almost nothing. Where God is dead, the mind of man recedes to the moment and then cannot affirm even the moment because it too is meaningless. The problem was well stated in a beautiful sonnet by a humanistic poet who, holding that God is dead, had to affirm logically the death of meaning in time. Trumbull Stickney, 1874-1904, to try to make it a source of existential joy, declaring, Live blindly and upon the hour. The Lord, who was the future, died full long ago. Knowledge, which is the past, is folly. Go, poor child, and be not to thyself abhorred. Around thine earth sun-winged winds do blow, and planets roll. A meteor draws his sword, The rainbow breaks his seven-coloured cord, and the long strips of river silver flow. Awake, give thyself to the lovely hours. Drinking their lips, catch thou the dream in flight. About their fragile hair's aerial gold, thou art divine. Thou livest, as of old Apollo springing naked to the light, and all his island shivered into flowers. In Zinj's greatest play, Riders to the Sea, the loss of the future, that is, God, is expressed less lyrically than by Stickney, and, as a result, the melancholy resignation shows clearly as Mauria concludes the drama with the grief-stricken comment. Michael had a clean burial in the far north, by the grace of Almighty God. Bartley will have a fine coffin out of the white boards and a deep grave, surely. What more can we want than that? No man at all can be living forever, and we must be satisfied. Death, a good coffin, and a deep grave. What more can we want than that? But men do want more. Stickney summons us to live blindly and upon the hour. But the existentialists of today, who stress most the existential moment, still concern themselves about ecology and the war. Stickney equated God and the future, declaring, The Lord, who was the future, died full long ago. Moreover, knowledge, which is the past, is folly. Since no sovereign decree and purpose exists, according to Stickney, there is no future. There is no meaning and consequence in time and history to make the future a valid concept. 
The same emptiness of meaning makes the past, which we know as knowledge, folly. All that remains is the moment, but the moment is then haunted by its meaningless nature, and, as a result, it cannot give the pleasure Stickney hopes for. How valid was Stickney's hope that the existential moment could replace God? Not at all, Stent would say. Gunther Stent, a professor of molecular biology at the University of California at Berkeley, sees the loss of meaning leading to the death of man, time, and history. The end of progress is already in view, because the concept of progress presupposes meaning and an approximation to a purposeful goal. Stentz foresees the end of the arts and sciences and the appearance already of an antiquarian kind of scientist, that is, a man who does his work, not because it has any meaning, but simply because he happens to enjoy doing it. In discussing, for example, the composer of experimental music, Stent observes that he not only does not add to the accumulated capital of meaningful statements about the world, but nothing could be farther from his mind than intending to do so. But the final stages of this evolutionary process have been reached with the experimental music of such composers as John Cage. For here, almost all rules that would allow communication to the listener of a musical structure have been abandoned. In one type of such experimental music, the temporal tonal sequence is purposely generated by pure chance, either by the composer in writing or by the performer in reading the score, so that the form is intentionally random. In another type, the composer writes intuitively, without consciously attempting to develop any particular idea or to reach any ultimate goal. Thus, the listener is left to his own devices to make of the music what he will. The structure he perceives in the piece, if any, is entirely dependent on his own personality, much as his interpretation of an ink blot in the Rorschach test also depends on his personality. Thus, with this development, music as an art which endeavours to discover and communicate truths about the world, has reached the end of the line. Without a concept of past and future, science is impossible. Van Til's assertion that science must presuppose the eternal decree of a predestinating, sovereign God is unwittingly confirmed by Stent, who observes, The scientists thinks he recognises some common denominator, structure, in an ensemble of events, infers these events to be related, and then attempts to derive a law, explaining the cause of their relation. An event that is unique, or at least that aspect of an event which makes it unique, cannot therefore be the subject of scientific investigation. For an ensemble of unique events has no common denominator, and there is nothing in it to explain. Such events are random, and the observer perceives them as noise. To surrender a concept of time which binds past, present and future in terms of a related meaning, is to surrender the reality principle for the pleasure principle. The golden age of existentialism will thus be the end of progress and the eventual death of man, because the unique moment is an intellectual, scientific and moral impossibility. By renouncing the past and the future for the existential moment, modern man has demanded an apocalyptic moment, instant paradise without any history or future. Karl Marx never swerved from this hope. In the German ideology, Marx declared, In communist society, where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes, 
society regulates the general production and thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow. To hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticise after dinner, just as I have a mind. Without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, shepherd or critic, In Marx's society, where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes, no man prepares to be a scientist, concert violinist, or flyer. Every man has instant realisation of his every vocational whim. Time and history are surpassed, and potentiality and actuality are one in Marx's apocalyptic moment. This stream of the apocalyptic moment was basic to the beatnik movement and then to the hippie movement. It is at the heart of all revolutionary movements from the French Revolution on. To deny time and history is to deny maturation. After Marx, we are what we will to be immediately. Inevitably, this denial of time leads to the affirmation of magic, the first principle of which is, as my will is, so mote it be. In other words, after Hegel, what my mind conceives as necessary and rational must therefore be, because the rational is the real. Time as a moral issue means time as the area of maturation and testing. It means time as history, the working out of God's purpose for man. Time, in this sense, is not a problem, but an opportunity for the Christian. His purpose, as Scripture requires it, is to redeem the time. Colossians chapter 4 verse 5, Ephesians chapter 5 verses 15 and 16. Time, kainos, is a quality or a season of meaning, and redeem means to buy up the opportunity. Arthur Way thus rendered Ephesians chapter 5 verse 16 as grasp at each opportunity, like merchants who eagerly buy up a scarce commodity. Time, moreover, is not a unique or a random thing, an endless sequence of unique existential moments, but rather an aspect of God's grand design and is thus totally meaningful. We live thus in a world of inescapable and total meaning, and every moment of time and every act of history furthers the development and explication of that meaning. Stent required a common denominator in events and moments in order to preserve science, but he bypassed God in his hope for meaning. As a result, his melancholy conclusion is the death of progress and of man in a vast, universal ensemble of unique events. Time did not move for Parmenides. It was, in fact, for him, an illusion. For Marx, time was to stand still in the apocalyptic moment of the communist order. Their common flight from God led them to find either nothing at all in the existential moment of time, or to expect of it an apocalyptic delivery of all things. The Christian must redeem the time, because the days are evil. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 16 Progress is a mandate. Evil must be overcome, and the kingdom of God set forth in all its claims and power. In terms of this calling, time is a wealth and an opportunity, and it is to be utilised to the full to bring all things into captivity to and under the dominion of God. Instead of a flight from time, the Orthodox Christian stands in time as in wealth, with a world to conquer with that wealth 